Good evening, everyone. We're just going to give it a moment for everyone to join. Um, thank you all. Thank you for joining. Just one more moment to let people get acquainted. Um, I'm Isaac Zablocki. I'm the director of film programs at the Moline Meyerson JCC Manhattan. Thank you for joining us. Um, we'll get officially started in a minute and I'll introduce our panel. Um, but I will tell you now is the time. Well, people, if you want to turn your cameras on, you're welcome to. Um, please be wearing clothes. Um, and um, we will um, have a conversation here for Chained, for those of you hopefully who saw the film already as part of our Israel Film Center Festival. Um, I'm going to take a moment to thank our partners. Actually, let me start by taking a moment. We're going to watch our trailer and then we'll do the official introduction. So um, please enjoy for one minute our trailer. Thank you. One, two, three, four. <laughs> So now is my opportunity to thank our partners. You saw them at the screen at the end of that trailer. Check them out on our website. Go to the partners page and see all of our ways, amazing partners. Um, but I'd like to highlight specifically um, tonight, I want to first of all highlight Ellen that does work as far as um, uh, um, children who are coming from uh, homes and spaces of um, abuse. Um, and of course, I want to give a big thank you to Moment Magazine. Um, check out Moment Magazine um, uh, um, and our conversation tonight is um, going to be led by um, Amy Schwartz. And Amy Schwartz is the book and opinion editor, editor at Moment Magazine. Um, so welcome, Amy, everyone. Um, I just want to say two words before I hand it over to Amy that, um, and you could always see in our chats, of course, um, um, different links to some of the things we bring up. Um, but let me mention um, also that, um, that, that first of all, um, we are living in trying times and I think uh, um, these are important. All of our films are important, but tonight's film especially is an important film that uh, um, connects a little bit to these times. And um, I um, hope that discussion um, is engaged with, and we hope that you could be a part of this discussion. So um, after Amy asks her questions, we're gonna open it up for a Q and A um, with the audience. If you have questions, you could write them in the chat box and we will open your mic so you could be a part of this conversation as well. I, I hope you have conversations after, have, have questions after seeing the movie change. Um, Chained is directed by Yaron Shani, who is here with us. Hi, Yaron. Thank you for joining us. Yaron Shani um, is, uh, amongst other things, the director of Ajami, the Academy Award nominated um, film. I hope you've all seen that film. It's re required viewing. Mm -hmm. um, I will also I will also say that um, um, Chained is part of a trilogy. Um, and uh, I think Chained stands alone as a film on its own, as do all the films in the trilogy. Um, but uh, I'm sure you're all gonna wanna see the other two films and you can discuss that in the conversation and um, your own could share a little bit more. Um, we also have the producer of the films, of all three films in the trilogy here, um, our friend Naomi Levary. Naomi, thank you so much for being here. And uh, she's coming live from Berlin. Yaron's coming live from Israel. And I think I've covered everything I need to cover. So I'm going to hand things over to Amy Schwartz. Amy, thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm really, I'm very happy to be here. Thanks to um, Isaac and the Film Festival for having me. Um, I'm also, uh, I really have to start by thanking um, 
Yaron and Naomi for this uh, amazing film. This, this, um, it's a wonderful, thought-provoking, and really an emotionally draining experience to uh, to watch it. Um, I'm going to start by saying I had I had been told that this was a very violent movie. In fact, um, I'm going to put Isaac on the spot and say that when when he was um, corresponding with Moment and we said we'd pick this one, his actual words I think were "Ooh, gutsy." Um, and so I thought, wow, this is going to be a really violent movie. Um, it turns out the violence is mostly implied and all the more powerful because of it. Um, the violent ending to the story without um, spoiling, I guess most of you have seen it, it seems in many ways inevitable, sort of in the classical tragedy sense, you see it coming a long way off. Um, so let me ask you both first, um, how important is that sense of violence in the story and what motivated you to tell a story about violence? Yaron, can you start? Wow, that's a big question. I think that violence is uh, one of the essence of existence. It's like uh, the creator of living violence. Um, violence between ideas, violence between people, violence for survival. So violence is a very, very important issue. And I think that if we are trying to find some meaning to our own lives through art, through drama, through storytelling, uh, we need to go courageously into places that are very hard for us. And these places, most of the time, involve violence. And so basically these three films and Chained in particular are based on reality, on things that we read in the newspapers and things that happen. And uh, our goal in this project is to really try to understand things in the deepest perspective that we can, what's going on in the human soul when violence erupts. Mm -hmm. Naomi, can I ask you as well? I mean, what did the, did was was it meaningful to you also that this film was had so much violence in it that that it? I'll be, I'll, I'll be very honest. Uh, I, I read the script, the initial script, because there's also a story behind that. I read the initial script and I didn't really know Yaron that well at the time. And I remember we were having discussions and I told him Yaron, but I need some grace, you know. I need to breathe, you know. Uh, and then I brought examples of how, you know, this hero and that hero, they won at the end. And he said, yeah, but sometimes you don't win. And I'm like, yeah, he's right. But no, you know, I'm used to having the good guy win uh, or, or, or redeeming himself or whatever. So it took me a long time to know your own and to also connect to the core that he's uh, creating from. And once I understood that, I completely uh, back up what he just told you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was I, I, my impression watching the film was that somehow the whole, his whole life, all the different things he sees are sort of soaked in violence of different kinds. Is, is that fair? So, so let's, let's take a step back to sort of specifics. That was kind of a, a, a vague question, but I know that this, the, um, as Isaac suggested, this is a, a story that um, goes very deeply into two themes that are constantly important and maybe particularly now, um, domestic violence, which is, I guess, sort of always with us, and police misconduct, um, a, thing, a theme which is um, obviously has become front and center in a way that you couldn't possibly have predicted when you were making the film that it would, in this particular case, it would drop into the middle of this, this moment. Um, Tell, can you say, talk about how the themes in the movie relate to this framework? Does it change how the movie is perceived? Maybe Naomi, you start and then we'll go back. Well, you know, I, I know these are, I, I don't know, I also feel it. These are uh, very troubling times and uh, the police uh, misconduct is in the focus. But I have to say that while making the film, you know, 
we saw violence everywhere. When we're concentrating and doing a piece about violence, you see it everywhere. It's like when you're pregnant, you see pregnant women all around you. So maybe even making this film has just this made me understand that the situation now, the actual situation that's going on now, is not something surprising for me because mm. we were so soaked into looking through this violence in the eye. And about how the film is perceived, I can only say, well, it would be very interesting to hear in this room because the film in Israel was released a while ago. So we're not getting like straight feedback anymore, um, but it would be very interesting to, to hear about it here. Yeah, Yaron, um, what about you? I mean, I notice also, I'll just add to the question and say that if I understood the film correctly, um, Rashi's kind of a good cop, essentially. He's not, I mean, the, the, the accusation against him appears not to be true. So how do you uh, relate that story? What is this, does this framework, what does this framework of focus on police violence and police misconduct do with a story like that? Well, actually the police thing is only a tool to get to something deeper, which is being a human being, also a policeman, but also a man, you know, somebody who perceives himself in a certain way and he's trying to be, to get his special place in the world as a somebody with authority, somebody who knows what is good, trying to protect others, especially women. Mm -hmm. And to, to see, well, I think that in Israel, you are going through something very intense now, but in Israel, the connection is different because it's more about husbands killing or boyfriends killing their wives. And sometimes they commit suicides most of the time they don't. And you try to think how come you somebody is killing the one person who is the most dear to them. And it's it's a very, very big issue. Now in, in news reports, it's mostly a very superficial, very, very uh, shallow way of looking at things. It's like, uh, this is a monster and, and how horrible and it's, Let's go to the pages of, uh, I don't know, let's see something else, something entertainment and things like that. It's very, very shallow, but the human beings behind these articles are real human beings like our fathers and brothers and the guy next door and the woman next door. So it, it was very, very important for us to try and to dig deep into the real stories, the real people, the complexity, the human complexity behind these stories, and to try to, to find out something. Because uh, from the research that we did, we see that these people who are killing their wives when they want to split up, they are not monsters, most of them. They are not monsters. They are like ordinary people, normative people, and you ask yourself, how come somebody who is not a criminal, he's a good guy, everybody who knows him never thought that he would do such a thing. And how come he, he does such a terrible thing? And that's something that is very important for us to, to try and to, to understand. If we take it to the police misconduct, which is also something that happens a lot, you know, uh, this is also a very complicated issue and I'm, I, I'm very close to it because ever since Ad Ajami, I was uh, really involved with policemen and, and police detectives and their lives and how they see the world, how they cope with what they are going through. And this is also a very complicated issue. Once you get politics inside it, it's you cannot really understand it in a full way. It, it becomes something else. So when you see these demonstrations, I mean, what do you think about the frame this puts around your movie? Or what do you think about it generally? If you don't mind addressing it. I think that policemen, I'm trying to connect it to what's going on now. Right. Uh, 
I think that policemen are going through something which is so hard, you know, to really on a daily basis uh, try to, to, to keep order and to, to handle people who are really tough and they are really in, in trouble. Mm -hmm. and they might be very violent and they might be uh, drunk or a lot of things. And you are in a danger when you're a policeman. You are really putting yourself in danger. It has its, its effect, effects and, and you become violent yourself and you can make mistakes all the time. And it's a matter of when you are dealing with terrible people, it's very hard to make a mistake, a terrible mistake, and do something horrible yourself. Mm -hmm. So it's a very, very problematic issue. Change is about something else, I think. It's, not a, it's about a person who is a policeman. Uh, being a policeman is also a, a mentality. It's also some kind of personality. But he could, could be somebody else. He, he could be also a... Uh, an engineer and get himself in the same position as Rashi. Mm -hmm. Right. The other, the, the story has other uh, domestic abusers in it featured, the one he um, meets at the beginning and then the one who throws his children out the window. So, and they aren't all police, they aren't all police. So you're say you're, you're looking at what would drive a person to do this kind of thing not that he's not to forgive it but just to see to understand i don't know if we can understand you know somebody, because these two stories are based on real things that happened mm -hmm. um i i don't think we can understand but we can we can see that there's something also in in us that can go very far in certain conditions and we can see that also people who are doing these things are not born as monsters. Something in their personal life brought them to this position. I'm not saying that we need to forgive them or to, you know, to, they are, the, people have to be responsible for their, what they are doing. But in the same time, we need to see also the other side and to try to understand the deep meanings of violence and the deep, the other side of violence is, is a big distress. Mm -hmm. It's like a, a way to cope with distress, especially for men, but also for women. Women are also can be violent, not less in a, vis a physical way. Mm -hmm. And we need to, to try to understand it and to, to, to see it in us mm -hmm. because we are also very, very violent sometimes. Mm. You can, I, can I just add to that? Please. Um, Jesse Aron was saying about how we look at ourselves, and I just have to add that many people after the film, they were so disappointed of Rashi that he did that thing because they identified with him so much, meaning we could really see ourselves and also lose ourselves because at certain points he does violent things, but we're identifying with him so much that we don't even notice. He's sitting in front of the house door and he won't let his family out. That's very, very violent. But viewers said, no, we kept on loving him until mm. he did this horrible thing at the end. That's interesting. Yeah, I've seen some interesting reactions to this film where the different feelings about Rashi were very split and people had very, very strong reactions on both sides, whether they loved him or they hated him. This, this, is, a good, um, this is a good segue to the other important question I wanted you to talk about, which is I know um, Yaron has, has you, you've, you've pioneered this interesting technique where these are real people. They're not actors. Um, Rashi, the actor who plays Rashi is him, was, a, was himself a cop. And can you talk about that? I would love to hear from both of you, your, your own first, but how, how you work with real people and you know, get past the acting idea. Well. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe, maybe this is well known, but I, it wasn't to me. So I wish you'd, you'd describe this. I don't know. Question. No, it, it's just that I'm, I'm, I've been answering this question for like a million times and I'm trying to find a way to, to answer it in a different way. Um, basically, 
uh, when I finished my film studies, I decided that I'm not into films, uh, fiction films, because I felt like it's, uh, it's too fictional for me. It's too fake. It's like writing dialogues and inventing characters and then giving the script to actors to perform it. I don't know. It felt for me something that was uh, a very interesting lie, a very thrilling experience, but it's very has li very little to do with reality, with the real nature of of living. And and I felt like I was really, really, I wanted to really understand and to see real people, not actors and to see, to, to experience real emotions and not perform emotions. So I guess that that brought me to this way of working, which is based on other experiments in, in cinema, uh, where we are not performing a script. It's like where we are trying to make the drama alive and the way I we did it, we don't need actors because they are not the thing that makes an actor professionally is that they they take a script with a lot of orders and they try to perform it as if it's authentic. It's very hard to do that. Our actors, our non-actors, are not acting in this sense. They are going into a, 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 a an adventure an emotional adventure. They, are, they have the, the, the opportunity to live a life of a different person. Inside a game, it's like a game, you know, where like children are playing, I'm the father, you are the mother, and let's see how it goes and learn from it. They are playing a game as adults. I'm a cop and I'm getting into this apartment and let's see what happens. And inside this game, really amazing things can happen because every non-actor is believing what is happening and de developing real emotions. But in the same time, they can stop when it gets too far and, and, okay, it's a game. It's only a game. We are not going the whole way to the dangerous areas. So it's like, it's, it's a way in, in which we can try, it's like psychodrama, you know, it's like trying to understand what is, what is going on with anger, the anger we have in us, our personal life, how we behave, how we react when we are playing it. So what's a thing, for instance, what's a thing that happened in this game that you didn't expect? Can you think of a, a time when mm -hmm. it went a direction that you didn't think it would go that wasn't? Well, it's, it works like this. We have a script with everything, dialogues and action and everything. But then we go out and we try to find people who, are, who share something with the characters. And there we find different people which are not the same as the characters, but they, they feel that they fit what we are looking for. So they change the script, they change the expectations. And then when we work with them and they, we let them build the relationships with the, between them, new things arise and we change the expectations again. And then when we are shooting, it's like, it's, it's alive, you know? It's like what's happening here. They don't know when they are knocking on the door. They don't know who is behind the door. If, if it's the first time that the character is getting into a house, it will be the first time that they will get into the house and everything is improvised. They don't have uh, dialogues. They don't have, uh, they don't know where they need to take it. So it's, it's almost completely them. And in this way, of course, it's not the same as we expected. It's not the same as the script. But the thing is that when we are working with them for so long and we get to know them so well, so we can expect that the main road will be the same, that the main plot will be the same as the script. 
And so, this is the, the main guide that we are keeping. So for instance, and, yeah. And also when we finish the shooting, we have so much material because so many things happen there. Uh, when we finished the shooting of this project, we had like 350 hours of shooting. So the editing is also an exploration of the potential. And so it's always open. We are inventing and rewriting and changing and experiencing and packaging it over and over again. So it's all the time surprises. Mm -hmm. So as it's all surprises. So I think we're, we're running out of time. Otherwise I would ask you lots more questions about this, but can I just ask you to talk a little bit about how this fits into the trilogy? This is a, a trilogy about love, you've said, stripped, chained and reborn. And I saw uh, you were quoted somewhere else as saying that without danger, pain and loneliness, love has no real meaning. Is that, is that what you're t telling us with this trilogy? Can you tell us how it all fits together? Actually, it's not me. I'm not, uh, you know, the Bible is talking about it. It's, it's so ancient, this notion that without hunger, we cannot understand the meaning of food. You know, without loneliness, we cannot understand the meaning of love. So it's, it's like the yin and the yang. We need to suffer and to lose in order to understand what it means to be alive, to breathe, to love. And this is also one of the reasons that uh, we decided in this project to go deep into tragedy and a very, very, uh, how should I say it? A very honest crises and emotions of crisis in order to really go through this process and get out and and see what we have in our lives and to appreciate it and to 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 handle it in a more in a wiser way so the whole trilogy is a tragedy all three parts every story is a tragedy <laughs> yeah. you know every story is is it you have a, a crisis in the middle of it because when you t when you get into a crisis, that's where you learn something. Mm -hmm. If everything goes smooth, you you learn nothing. No story. Yeah. Can Can Naomi talk for one second about how how you produce this remarkable years long uh, vision with all these uh, non professional actors, and then we'll go to Q and A. <laughs> um, yeah. So our uh, main effort was to not kill ourselves <laughs> um, because everything was really unexpected just to maybe translate a bit what Yaron said into like uh, technical uh, aspects is that we have a bunch of non-actors that are also meeting for a long time before the shooting. They, they, they meet in order to perform as a family, to perform as friends, to understand each other. They never see a written script. And we knew we're going for a period of 10 months of chronological shooting. It's not every day we're shooting, but we're going, the time is real time. If Rashi needs to uh, grow a beard, I mean, even the physical time is, is, is real. Everything's real about it. Um, and there were no rehearsals. There was no big crew. We had two students of Yaron holding cameras. And uh, when Yaron came to us at the beginning and said, okay, they, they, I have these two students uh, and we have no rehearsals and we have one takes and, and me and my partner, Sarah, we were like, okay, that's not going to happen. I mean, we don't have rehearsals. You know, we, did, we really didn't get him at this point because Ajami was made, you know, with the crew, also with non-actors, but with the crew in 20 days, 25 days, not 10 months. And then Yaron explained this, this idea, this notion that you know, professional cinematographers, they're amazing, they could be great, but they're used to a certain method that they can't free themselves from, even if they're very open people, even if they're very flexible, they're just used to something. And I need this raw, this raw material, these people that can, can really uh, dance with me. So with these scary notions, and, and we didn't do life very easy for your own. He had to prove, we did a lot of tests, but eventually he was, he was absolutely right, um, as we can see in the films. 
Um, so for us, it was really at one point when it sank, what we're doing here, so we could really give Yawan or try to give him a secure world he can work in, like with minimum interference, which is not our usual way of working as producers, I must say. Um, but but we also had this strong notion of Yawan knows exactly where he, he gives, he never demands from anyone else more than he demands from himself. And he will always prove what he wants to do because he has this sense of responsibility. It's not his first film and also in his personality, it's a very communal understanding and sensitive person. So we said, okay, it's gonna be, you know, either the best experience, the most thrilling one, or we are gonna go bankrupt. And uh, yeah, it was fun. That's great. So we went for it. Yeah. All right, I think I see a lot of questions building up in the chat. So thank you both very much. I'll pass it back to Isaac. It's really a, an, an honor to speak with you. Thank you. And, and, and folks, I just want to remind you all that our films are available all week. So this is a chance to, to, to you to tell your friends to see these films and to join us for some of the other ones. Um, our first question is going to come from Phyllis. Phyllis, you're on the air. Now, am I muted now? Yeah, okay. Um, so I, I really like the film. I mean, it's, it's difficult to watch, but I thought it was really uh, excellent. Um, and uh, I, I guess if the camps between those who like or dislike Rashi, I put me in the, in the like camp. Um, I, I thought he was a tragic figure, almost Job-like, although he sets things in motion really himself. So it's not really Job, but anyway, things do happen that bring on so many tragic aspects to his life. Um, and then I looked at some reviews. Uh, I think I found three reviews, including in Variety, and they all called him a bully. So I wondered, I mean, I thought he was well-intentioned and it got me to think about, can a bully be well-intentioned or are these reviews wrong to refer to him as a bully? Mm. Nami, do you want to take this? No way. <laughs> <laughs> He's your guy. <laughs> He's your character. Well, I have to say that I'm trying my best when I'm dealing with somebody else's life. I'm, I'm trying my best to, to respect the humanity of this other person and to try to not to judge and to, to learn something. Uh, I think that behind every bully, you have a soul. Uh, and I'm sure that when somebody is bullying somebody else, it's because he's going through something that only he can understand, or maybe not even understand. It's very complicated. It's very hard. But when, when I'm dealing with human beings, like I, I would like people to treat me or my, my loved ones, I want them to see the complexity behind this title bully, you know, uh, behind this title like uh, murderer or uh, even, uh, I don't know, a, a violent policeman. We need to see the, 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 the complexities and even the paradoxes inside life, inside the personality. So, I don't, I, I don't, I understand that when you write a critic, uh, when you're a critic, you need to write something very like, very straight and very uh, black and white, but I don't see it this way, you know. A bully is something that, you know, you, you need to get out of the way. It's, it's a bad guy. And for me, there are no bad guys in life, actually. Well, there is the, such a thing that people are doing bad things. But if we walk in them sh in their shoes, and, or if they were like our son, sons or daughters, we would see something more complicated. So to, to see Rashi as a, as a bully, as just a bully is very, very superficial. It's very shallow to treat him this way. But I, I can understand, you know, 
you know, it happens to us when we are treating each other as, as titles, you know. Well handled. Um, <laughs> Allison, you're up next. You have a question. Hello. Um, I just wanted to know, because I think in Hebrew, the title of the film is Ha'inayim Shali. Is that correct? So in English, I mean, I think that that translates to my eyes. And I know at the end of the film, it's reading a letter that he had written. Um, but the English that we're going by is Chained. So I just wanted to know what's going on with the title, because Chained and my eyes are two very different tones. So. No. <laughs> <laughs> that myself. Um, it's a very, very good question. Uh, in Hebrew, it's a saying. It's not my eye. I mean, that's the literal translation, but there is a saying, apple of my eye. And I'm Shili, it means apple of my eye. And, you know, it's, of course, a, a way to show love and also a way that Rashi shows love. And I won't go back to the origin because before it was a trilogy, it was one film called Apple of My Eye, but we won't go there. I'll just try to uh, explain uh, what led us to different titles in English. Because it's a trilogy, we also try to tell a story with the titles. And uh, therefore, we have one word of different situations in love. Uh, or, or violence, or, or so it's stripped, chained, and in this case, you know, um, Rashi is chained to Abigail, and he's also chaining her to him, so it made a lot of sense for us, um, and then Reborn is also something you experience through love, and it's also the third film, and I have to say has some grace in it, so I'm happy to say that, um, and therefore it's also about uh, being reborn. Um, so, you know, I think we kept apple in my eye in Hebrew because it, we had like, um, it was the core, I think in a way it was the core from which we started from. So we, we kept that uh, title in Hebrew, but it wouldn't make sense in a language of a trilogy to say stripped apple of my eye, reborn. I hope that answers the question because uh, it's a lot of history there. <laughs> Well, it's like apple of my eye is like the one of the strongest uh, expressions of love. You know, you are the something that I cannot live without, and the, it's beautiful. It's it's really you know it's it's a great expression of love, but it also has a, a dark side in it, because if I cannot live without you, then I'm so dependent on you. Then what happens if you want to be to do things that are against me or don't go along with what, how I want to live? What sh shall we do then? So I start to develop ways of controlling you through manipulations, through violence. Through... So there's a dark side to this notion that I love you so much that I can never let you go. We are, the, we are the same body. An apple of mine has this in it. And chained is, is, says the same, but in a, in a more like, uh, in, a, in a different way. I think I think that um, a actually an apple of my eye, there's ownership, there's, there's you know, you, you, you Shali, it's mine. Exactly. You own that person's eyes, um, apple of my eyes. Um, it's, it's, which, which is possessiveness. It actually, in English, the apple of my eye is just the eyeball. So <laughs> that's, it's an old, it's an old word for the eyeball. So it's really, you're part of me. You're the thing I need to see. Yeah. And seeing is, you know, is what gives meaning to things. So the way I see you, the way I see our relationship is also very important in this sense. Because I see you as part of me. I see you as something that belongs to me. Chain to me. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> it works. Um, we have a question from Robin. Robin, you're up next. Uh, a great film. And I did not think that Rashi was a bully. I just thought he was a he actually, I felt was trying to help people, but in a maybe not so great way sometimes. Um, but I didn't think he was a bully. I think he cared for people. And my question was, 
what were the actual reasons that Abigail finally left him? Did she think he mm -hmm. was a child molester or what? I, I wasn't sure like what developed that made her do that. I think Nomi wants to, to answer that. What, why are you doing this? <laughs> apple, of, apple of my eye. Um, I'm thanks to you. Um, look, so at, at, in this film, again, it's a trilogy, so it's very interesting to see the three parts, but we'll just refer to this film. Um, I believe, or that's how I felt throughout the reading and doing and making, is that Abigail is feeling more and more suffocated um, she feels more and more violence at home. She feels she's not safe. Um, that every time she tries to talk about things, what you do when you have a relationship, she uh, receives a very violent reaction. Um, and I think the fact that we are so focused on Rashi as spectators and we learn to identify him, that sometimes we're blind to what she's going through. And I think it's a reflection for us. So basically I think, you know, she left because she had too much. It was all about, you know, shouting and, and, and even physically, you know, um, touching, I mean, um, restraining her, her daughter. And he just wanted too much of her. And she felt she suffocated. So that's, that's the reason how I see it in this film. If you would see the, the trilogy on, on one of the films, we can see uh, Abigail's arc and what, really, what, what she's really going through also externally and not only with Rashi within the house. Um, there, there's been a few questions from the audience that uh, don't wanna um, ask them live about the letter at the end. Could you tell us a little bit about the letter at the end? Yaron. Yaron. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, it's like we felt that uh, if we finish with this terrible shooting, it will be so horrible that it might, we felt that we need something to calm down after this shooting, after this terrible shooting and to, to let the, the people get out of the experience in, 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 with something to think about. And actually this letter of love about the white flowers and the red flowers and what they symbolize is something that came out of the, the actor. When we were shooting, we, we shot a, a scene where he's uh, uh, delivering, delivering flowers to, to Avigail. And this is what he came up with, you know, it's from him. It's something that he told me, listen, I have something very good. I have something very, very, very romantic. And this is what he wanted to write on the note, on the, on the bouquet. And, you know, when I listen to it, and it's really a great expression of love, you know, red is the color of the blood, that my blood that flows in your veins, and white is the purity, you are so pure, you are perfect. And it felt like, okay, this is also can be a, a, another explanation to what brought Rashi to this terrible situation, eventually. Seeing things so totally, you know, in such an extreme way. So this is, this became like an, a, a, an ending with a thought about what happened there. We have time for two more questions. We're gonna take one from Aaron. Aaron, you're up. Um, hi, I just had a question. Was there any other alternative ending that was ever seriously considered or was this sort of the way it was scripted and that's the way it had to be? Actually, the, the initial idea for the, for the script came from this terrible thing that happens every once in a while, that somebody kills his partner because she wants to split up. So it's, uh, it, it started from there. It, th that was, that was, how should I say? It's something that we, we couldn't go anywhere else. And it was actually very hard to make this 
ending because we knew that it's going to be so terrible for for viewers because they the, the the authenticity and the the feeling that we are dealing with real human beings and it's not acting and it's something so so attached to reality to see such a terrible killing it's 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 it might be too much for people who go to see a film in cinema but we are very proud of it so actually no it it was a decision that was there from the beginning and we stick to it until the end um and that, that's an actually an interesting scene because obviously that one um couldn't be improvised yeah is that is was that a unique moment in in the film would you say yeah that was the only time that i came to them and told them okay now that's what's going to happen and it and we had to stop for an hour to to talk about it you wow. know go through this terrible emotions that they they had to go through because they understood that where it's going and they had to do it unlike all the other shootings where they were just doing some th- things that they felt they should do here it was really no now rashi and the ran the actor are splitting up you are not rashi now and this is what rashi is doing and it was it was hard they didn't know they didn't know till then that's where it was going yeah yeah hmm. that was the last shooting day in this narrative and they knew it in the in the just before the we shot the scene wow wow yeah. i can't imagine when you were you were developing a character for a year living as a character and then learning such a tragic moment i mean it was hard to watch in the film i can't imagine having to be the actors there um we we do have uh, one last question from brenda brenda or comments okay um hi i you know i think the film was a really great film and i think it's going to be a very important film for people who are trying or organizations that are trying to teach about the development of domestic violence and um you know this is uh you know i wanted to just ask if anybody was from the you know from the audience or or from the makers of the film was going to point out that this was a man who was incapable of listening to anyone else outside of himself not to the children in the park and not to his wife and not to his wife's daughter um and that he was only pushing his own point of view it doesn't you cover over a lot of things when you say when you use a word like bully but he he was he only saw the world he didn't take in anything from outside himself and this is because he had a very diminished point of view of, of a diminished sense of his own self we saw a picture of him from earlier in his life when he was a heavy guy he, he or you know he was a sort of a diminished boy uh, and he blew himself up to, in, to into this strong man to try to bully uh, to try to buoy his his own um you you know inner sense of weakness and you know the 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 idea that there was going to be domestic violence that he was going to take control over his wife and push her against the wall or shoot her it was obvious from the very beginning of the film uh, you know as a person who is involved professionally somewhat in this field um i knew it was coming and it's very important for people to realize that men who are controlling It, I mean, it happens with women, yes, but by and large, it's men and, and men who are controlling of the behavior uh, of their families are, are, in a, are a, um, it's a form of domestic violence. It doesn't, it's emotional control and, and it doesn't have to be, um, result in physical violence. It's equally as diminishing and demeaning to the, to the partners. So it was a very important film for me. Thank you. Um, Thank you, Brenda. Can you both share a little bit more about where these, where the rest of the trilogy is going and um, some distribution plans and also what you're working on next? 
Yes, Naomi. <laughs> no, Naomi, I'll let you start. Oh, thank you. Um, so I'll just really uh, just say very shortly about the trilogy because I, I do think it's important. Um, the, the three films, we, we set out on this journey in one film. We were about to make one film called the Apple of My Eye and it had different plot lines. And because of Yaron's method, it gradually grew, grew on us and grew on us and the stories got their own lives. And then we realized that we have to edit this into one film, but if we'll edit it into one film, we'll lose so much. So it became three films. Um, basically, Chained um, was the first film. It was not the first film to be released on a world premiere in a festival, but it was the first film to be commercially released in Israel. That happened, um, when did that happen, Your own in December? February, February sorry. Um, um, and I think it performed well. It was a high winter with horrible storms, but even though it performed well. The two other films, uh, Stripped, um, was actually the first film to have a world premiere in Venice in 2018, but it will probably be the last to be released in Israel. Now to tell you when Reborn and Stripped will be released in Israel is difficult because the COVID-19 situation just pushed everything forward. We were supposed to be already with um, Reborn uh, in March in Israel. Um, but lucky for us, uh, France saw and loved, uh, a distributor for France uh, saw and loved these films and Chained and Reborn will both be uh, distributed when the cinemas are reopening in France in July. So, and it's very interesting because they're showing the chain's gonna start and after two weeks, you'll have Reborn in the cinemas. So whoever is curious and lucky can see both films one after the other in the cinemas. And I think that whoever gets the chance, saying it very modestly, whoever gets the chance to see the three films has an experience of three films that stand alone, but as, has also gets a larger notion, I think, of what Yaron is uh, saying about uh, violence, uh, gender violence, love. Um, so I hope that answered the question regarding what we're working on now, Yaron, that's a question to you. Well, I, now I'm resting mostly. <laughs> um, uh, I, th I, the, the, I think that we can start feeling this urge to go again into the human existence to, to try and to go and find real people and real stories and to tell the human story through multiple storylines of people who are experiencing loss and grace. And the idea is to go to Jerusalem you know, this conflicted and very, very important place and to, to show stories that have never been shown before because uh, Jerusalem is, is a place where you have a lot of films about and a lot of stories about, but they are mostly invented and we are, and the, 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 the ability to, to bring real people and real stories into a fictional film is something that is very appealing. So this is, our thoughts about the future. Um, I want to thank you both for an amazing job with an amazing film and being so daring and so brave and for joining us here. Um, I want to thank Moment Magazine and I want to especially thank Amy for taking on this very brave conversation. Amy, let me hand it to you for some final words. Um, yes, I also I want to thank I want to thank both of you and all the all the viewers who asked such such great questions. And I just wanted to um, look back for a moment when we were talking about politics and, and obviously there are politics surrounding this. And I was thinking, listening to you that in this, this endeavor in its complexity and in its humanity is really almost the exact opposite of politics. It's the antidote to some of the political sort of the difficulties of, of um, the you know the things we're enmeshed in and i just want to say we need we need that we need that in addition to politics and as a balance to it this way of seeing the human being and for that i thank you and thanks to everybody
Thank you all. Tomorrow we have um, our film No Zoo in Tel Aviv. Please uh, join us for that at 4 p.m. Um, and for the rest of the films till Sunday as part of the Israel Film Center Festival. Thank you for joining us. Thank you again, Yaron, Naomi, and Amy. Have a good night, everyone. Please stay safe and look forward to seeing you too.